the space race, no one was actually sure if human beings could survive in zero gravity. Some specialists thought our internal organs would just fall apart and we'd drop down dead, or float away dead anyway. Americans sent a whole menagerie of animals into orbit to see what it would do for them, and they all survived. That wasn't really the point. The point was... <laughs> the point was... Oh, God! The point was, would a man be able to do something useful in zero gravity? For example, operate a spaceship. So what they did was they sent a trained chimpanzee called Ham into orbit on the 31st of January 1961. Ham had been trained to pull a series of levers in response to flashing lights. The red lever for the red light and the white lever for the blue light. If he did that right, he was rewarded with a banana-flavoured chip. If he got it wrong, he was electrocuted. Ham is laced in his couch and wired for sound. The electrodes on his feet will give him a gentle shock in case he forgets. Oh, it's a parlor. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh, hello. Hiya. How are you doing? Woo. Oh. <laughs> and this is where this child's game comes in, because it's a very, very similar thing. What happens is these lights Go on in sequence. Da, da, da. I have to get the same sequence when I press these two little buttons. If I get it wrong, it gives me a shock. Ow! <laughs> Ham the chimp didn't have any problem with this. And he was doing it in zero G, which I'm going to try in a minute. Ah! Da, da. I've forgotten. <laughs> I hate this thing. Here we go. It was that one, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Well, uh... okay. <laughs> I can do it. I can do it. Can't. Sorry. Oh. Oh. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> The tests carried out in the Vomit Comet showed that astronauts would be able to function in zero gravity. <laughs> oh, God! Space flight's absolutely hilarious. Thanks awfully. Mm. Now, that was obviously terrific fun, but also surprisingly exhausting. So we should spare a thought for the astronauts who had to do that thousands and thousands of times, because every time a new piece of kit was developed or a new procedure was suggested, they had to go and try it out in zero gravity. It might be how to put a space suit on, how to have a shave, how to take a comfort break. It all had to be tried out in the Vomit Comet. And while all that was going on, other people were busy building rockets, including, interestingly enough, me. Because back then, one of the most exciting things you could get for your birthday was the construction kit of the Saturn V rocket. Here, for example, is the bit where you construct stage two. You've got five of those little rocket engines. They come in two halves. You have to glue those together. Fantastically exciting and evocative. Anyway, if you think this looks quite complicated, you should have seen how they drew the real thing, because they did quite literally draw it. This was the sort of work that was done by men who had pencils behind their ears. They envisaged things, they drew them on paper, they drew them again and again until they got them right, and then some other people went off and they bent metal, they welded things, and they riveted stuff together. Slide rules, protractors and log tables produced this beast, capable of flying to the moon. At Cape Kennedy, it's a wonderful day for a wonderful event, the first man flight to the moon. Just look at this awe-inspiring sight behind here, the great moon rocket ready on its pad, like a great cathedral tower of ice in the morning light. It 
is very complicated. In fact, it is still regarded as the most complicated machine ever built. But at the same time, it's actually rather low tech. In fact, if you look at it closely, it appears to be the combined efforts of a central heating engineer and a light aircraft manufacturer. That is all pipes and valves and unions and seals, and the rocket itself is aluminium sheet and rivets and screw heads. It's quite remarkable, really. And it's even better when you're shown around by someone who's actually flown one to the moon. I must congratulate you on the size of your rocket. Uh, I always forget how big it is until I see it again. Yeah, we had the heaviest launch vehicle for Apollo 17. Harrison Schmidt was one of the last men to ride a Saturn V. He wasn't a fighter jock. He was selected because NASA wanted to send a scientist up there. The other thing that strikes me about it as well, looking at it in bits and thinking about the launch, is the basic principles of rocketry and a big rocket are actually quite simple, aren't they? I mean, rocket engines in principle are much simpler than, say, petrol engines, but it's just the amount of actual stuff that you need to do it on that scale. Well, you have to control the burn, you have to control the injection uh, of the materials that are going in, uh, and uh, that has to be very precisely controlled to maximize the thrust. It's not actually very sophisticated. It's pipes, tubes, wires, rivets, aluminium sheet. Well, you have to move uh, liquids and electrons. <laughs> yeah. And uh, mostly liquids. And the, uh, at the time, the, the lightest weight structural material they had was uh, aluminum alloy. So that is liquid oxygen and kerosene. Kerosene. Para yeah. a aviation fuel, in effect. Yeah. And um, that is a bomb, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, the whole thing is. I can't believe there wasn't a moment of doubt in your mind that when you sat up at that pointy bit, when you thought, that's a hell of a lot of fuel underneath, <laughs> and it only needs well, a ropey bit of riveting by some bloke. I and... think we all believe that the uh, launch escape system would save us if there was any problem. That's confidence. This rocket had six million components. Even with NASA's target of 99.9% .9 success, they could expect 6,000 parts to fail, even on a good launch. One of the interesting things is that when you, you see the thrusters up there on the side of the service module, each one of those has about 50 pounds thrust. Right. And you always have to think of that in terms of 1.5 million pounds of thrust in the F1 engine. And, and the spectrum of technology that was required to make this kind of an adventure happen. That's a very good pub fact, that, Astronaut Schmidt. Thank you very much. <laughs> That'll be useful. My pleasure. <laughs> but what still amazes me is this. The vast majority of the giant rocket stack, three whole stages, 94% of its fuel, got it just 100 miles from Earth. The basics of it are this. This bit up here, plus the lunar module that it docks with is, wait for it, the spacecraft. This is the bit we have to send to the moon. All of this bit is the launch vehicle. Now, for this bit to go to the moon, it has to be accelerated to nearly 25,000 miles an hour so that it can escape the pull of Earth's gravity and be captured by the moon's gravity. The simple way of thinking about this is like the gearbox of a car. First gear sends you up through the dense atmosphere to 6,000 miles an hour. Second gear accelerates you to just over 15,000 miles an hour through the upper atmosphere. Third gear here takes you into orbit above the Earth, and then it fires again, that's fourth gear, that takes you out of orbit and on the way to the moon. Finally, you're going through the vacuum of space. In this, you're coasting, you're in top gear. Sitting on top of 7.5 million pounds of thrust was going to be buttock clenching, even for a fighter jock. NASA did their best to weed out any with the wrong stuff. They concocted a brutal program of tests which happened at places like Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. I suspect today is not going to be very relaxing.
Back in the 1960s, the face of Air Force Dr. Dan Fulgham was one no astronaut wanted to see. Hello, James. Hello, Doctor. You ready for a little spin today? Yes. All right. This doesn't seem too threatening, this one, to be honest. It's like a roundabout. Well, the purpose of this device, of course, is to test your tolerance uh, to disorientation. Well, I've heard that astronauts actually fear Brooks Air Force Base. It's their least favorite place on the planet. Is that true? Well, not, not exactly, but uh, most pilots don't want to find out that they've got some shortcoming, if you would. So assuming I have a reasonable tolerance to your rotating chair, does that mean I am suitable for space flight? Could I potentially go and do a space mission? Uh, physically, uh, probably yes. Let's try it. Let's light this candle. You ready? Eyes closed, sir. Yes, sir. Here we go. Starting to spin. So I'm going to the right, mm -hmm. yes, clockwise. Poof. This is child's play. But I have a feeling it won't all be so easy. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Sergeant Scott, nice to meet you. James, hello. I think Sergeant Scott here's got something a bit less pleasant for me in his centrifuge chamber. This is where the torture peaked for the Apollo astronauts, too, where they were subjected to the crushing gravitational forces they'd experienced during the launch of the Saturn V rocket. Whoa. It smells a bit like an old Jag I once had in here. OK, so your next ride is going to be the 3G for 15 seconds. OK, Houston, we're ready to go. I think. Go ahead and check my crew. Data station ready. is ready. Operator ready. is ready. Medical ready. is ready. Final ready. And three, two, one, engage. Leg tight, deep breath. And you're on top, breathe. Short and sharp. Breathe. One, two, three. There you go, squeeze your legs, your butt. Breathe. Okay, don't work as hard. Breathe. One, two, three. You're doing a good job, keep it up. And you are coming down to the police stop. Okay. okay. Is, is my heart and everything still working? Your heart is working. Well, let's check with the doc. <laughs> You're doing fine. Righto. We're going to do 5G for 30 seconds, sir. 30? Yes, sir. And ignore it. <laughs> Three, two, Bracing. one, engage. And legs tight, deep breath. Oh. And you're on top, breathe. Short and sharp, breathe. One, two, there you go. We'll stay with my count. Breathe. One, two, breathe. Squeeze your legs, your butt. Breathe. OK, can you talk to me, sir? Yes, the face doesn't feel very good. I can't move my arms. You're all gone. You still see all the green lights? Yeah. Three, you're doing a good job. One. And you're coming all the way down. Okay. You can relax. Oh, that was 30 seconds. Yes, sir. 5G, so a Saturn V launch, the burn of the first stage, you'd have to put up with that for about two and a half to three minutes. Then it would go suddenly to naught. Then you'd have another couple of minutes at three, three and a half G. Wow. And that presumably is why they lie on their back, as I've just experienced G Z, or G Z as the Americans call it. That is, the G is going that way, and it pulls the blood out of your head, goes down. That's where you've got to tense up your butt and your gut. Uh, if you're lying on your back, you don't get that problem so much. But then, of course, all that heaviness I felt in my arms, you'd feel in your chest, it would be like people sitting on you, and then that would make breathing very difficult. So either way, you've got to be... <laughs> you've got to be pretty tough. Whoa. Good job, sir. Thanks. The boots felt too big when you put them on, but now they feel just right. Surviving these tests was a superhuman feat, 
and proof an astronaut could withstand extremes of physical and mental strain, yet still keep their heads enough to fly the most complicated machine ever built. Speaking with the astronauts, I learned that, in fact, none of them actually enjoyed having to come here and do all this stuff. And more importantly, they all agree that no matter what they went through here, absolutely nothing, nothing could prepare them for the reality of riding a Saturn V. Five, four, three, two, all engines running. Lift off. We have lift off. 49 minutes Suddenly, all that ruthless preparation made sense. The crushing forces, the adrenaline, the sheer challenge of flying this thing were totally unprecedented in the history of flight. I thought I was prepared, because we had trained for it so much, but when I was in the actual event, sitting on the top of the Saturn V, 360 feet away from the engines, you can start to feel the vibration, I thought. This thing is shaking way too much. I don't know if the metal in this spacecraft can withstand this shaking. We don't know if you'll be here later, gentlemen, but all the flight. I don't think anyone is ever prepared for that. It is a magnificent experience. Our observation booth here is literally being shaken apart. Our tape recorders are being thrown to the floor by the roar of this mighty rocket. The vibration is so heavy, you can't read the dials in the cockpit. Roll complete, ELF ready. Right your roll. Well, I'm thinking, this thing can come apart. Something's wrong. Well, something wasn't wrong. It was the fact that I had never been in a vehicle or anything else that had the vibration and shaking and noise that this Saturn V had. What a ride, baby. What a ride. It's exhilarating. Plus, you know what you're doing. You're on your way to the moon. There is really nothing to say about it. What can you say about a site like that? So how did James get his helmet on without messing up the hair? An in-depth look at his training to prepare for the edge of space on BBC Four now. And here on BBC Two, India's love affair with its national sport. In the last of the series, Empire of Cricket, next. <laughs>